All right, so this is our last video on post-classical China. And what we're going to do here is look at the uh, influence of China on the rest of East Asia. So China is the most influential part of East Asia, but they're not the only part of East Asia. So let's see what is happening outside of China and how China is influencing other places in East Asia. So the first place we're going to look at is Korea. Uh, Korea is at various points in Chinese history is uh, sometimes part of China. Sometimes it's independent, uh, but it is always heavily influenced by China. And generally speaking, when we think about Korea and China, the Koreans like this influence. So the Koreans like this influence uh, by China. And we can tell this is true through a lot of uh, Chinese or uh, Korean uh, architecture that looks like Chinese architecture. Uh, they also adopted Confucianism, and eventually also Buddhism, like the Chinese did. They even went so far as to uh, build their capital to resemble the Chinese capital at Chang'an. So the Koreans tend to like Chinese influence. Uh, they did participate willingly in the kowtow. So remember, the kowtow is this uh, ritual humiliation which opens up Chinese trade networks. So the Koreans willingly participated in the kowtow, and this benefited Korea greatly. Opening Chinese trade markets uh, with Korea was very beneficial to the Koreans. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the other side of this, Vietnam is also kind of in the same sphere of influence with Korea. So they are sometimes part of China. They're also sometimes independent. But they did so unwillingly. So they were unwillingly influenced. And, and really, as soon as as soon as they could rebel and gain independence, they did. So they were really forced to be part of China. They did not willingly accept Chinese influence, although some of it comes indirectly through trade. They were more or less unwillingly influenced by the Chinese. 
Uh, so they they did do the kowtow, but they were forced to do it. Uh, again, they also had Confucianism, but they were kind of forced to do it. Although they did like the education, and the education, the education part of Confucianism they liked, and they kept they kept that part. But generally speaking, the rest of Confucianism the Vietnamese weren't all that keen to. Uh, Buddhism diffuses here naturally, kind of organically. And it, it sticks. The Vietnamese like it. For a lot of the same reasons that the Chinese do. Like it helps with daily life. The Buddhist temples are, are helpful. And so they're generally accepted by people wherever Buddhism shows up. One difference between Vietnamese and Chinese society is that Vietnam is less patriarchal. And so it's more likely to see maybe not women in power, but to see women having an equal role in society. Something that you would definitely not see in China and you would definitely not see it in Korea because the Koreans are basically copying what the Chinese are doing. So when we think about these other, uh, these other places in, in East Asia, Korea generally likes Chinese influence. Vietnam generally doesn't. So if, if you take anything away from this, they're both influenced by China Korea, however, is influenced willingly, and they adopt this stuff on their own. The, Vietnam the Vietnamese are forced into it, generally speaking. Now, the other major society in East Asia that we haven't yet talked about is Japan. Now, Japan was never conquered by China. And they were never conquered by China, but they were heavily influenced by Chinese ideas through trade and other ideas of cultural diffusion. So their next door neighbors it's not weird that they would kind of be similar. They were never conquered by China. So all of this stuff happens organically. Uh, the Japanese willingly adopt these ideas. Uh, you know, it does, it does help to be an island nation. That means that you kind of get to do some of this stuff on your own. You get to pick and choose what you adopt or don't adopt. Uh, being an island does give you a, a sense of protection that way. So things that diffused to Japan, um, so art and architectural styles, uh, Confucianism also made its way to Japan, but again, they adopted it themselves. Uh, but they also retained their native religion, which is called Shintoism. 
So Shintoism has a lot of uh, attributes of ancestor veneration, but it also has a lot of attributes of like nature worship. And we're not going to, we don't need to go super in depth into what Shintoism is, but the idea is that they have a native religion and they keep their native religion because nothing ever comes to completely displace it. Uh, eventually, Buddhism does show up in Japan, uh, but it kind of shares the religious arena with Shintoism. Uh, it doesn't replace it or merge with it like we saw in China. Now, the, the height of Japan here is known as the Heian period. This is from 794 to 1185. And what, what we see in this period, and it's going to influence Japanese society as we move forward in, in, in the course is that we have a Japanese emperor who is technically in charge, but the real power exists in the rich landowning class. So these are the guys who are actually running the show. The emperor has technically the power, but he's basically a puppet that the rich landowners control. And in this system, we see a lot of Chinese influence in social and cultural areas. So, for instance, uh, a lot of the upper class people speak the Chinese language. So within... In here, we're going to see a lot of Chinese influence, like they're going to speak Chinese language. Uh, they're going to be educated in a Confucian style. Uh, they're going to read Chinese literature. They're even going to adopt that equal field system that we talked about in our first video here. So the rich landowning class really adopts a lot of Chinese stuff. Uh, one exception to this, so most of the literature was Chinese. But there's one exception that kind of bears a little bit of mention because it was written by a woman. Uh, so there's a Japanese story. So there's a, there's a Japanese story. Uh, that was written in Japanese by a woman. And that's why this is uh, worth talking about, is because this story is written by a woman in Japanese. Uh, and this is called The Tale of Genji. And it's a, it's a pretty typical story. I mean, it's not, it's not an exceptional story, except that, you know, at the time it would have been you know, a new story. When we're reading these kinds of stories, we've heard all these stories told before. But basically, it's the it's the story of a of a prince who is 
aging and kind of regrets his like lost opportunities and chances at love. But the important part of this, like you're never going to be asked anything in particular about the tale of Genji. What's important about the tale of Genji is that it's a Japanese story written in Japanese language by a woman at a time when the Chinese are reading Chinese or when the Japanese are reading Chinese literature, the upper class is speaking Chinese language and women don't really have much of a role. Here you have an example of the complete opposite of that. And that's why this is an important point to be made here. Now, eventually the Heian period begins to decline. And we see this for a number of reasons. Uh, two of the noble families that are running Japan, two noble families uh, kind of consolidate power. And we get a civil war. Uh, Around the same time, uh, the equal field system begins to begins to fail. And one of the reasons for that is that there's a limited amount of land. That's one of the problems with being on an island is that you only have so much land. And so the equal field system that the Chinese can use because they can always go out and conquer some more land, it fails in Japan because there's only so much land that they have that they can distribute. So these two things, the civil war and the failure of the equal field system, leads to the establishment. So this decline gives us a kind of military dictatorship in Japan. And the guy running this is called a shogun. He's like the chief general. Now the emperor is still there the emperor is still a figurehead, but the shogun kind of replaces the role of the noble families. So instead of the noble families running the Japanese government, now it's the military running the Japanese government, still with this emperor kind of acting as a figurehead leader of Japan. Uh, so during this period, during this period of this military dictatorship, uh, Japan kind of becomes more decentralized, meaning that local leaders have more control They have even more control than before. So local leaders have more control, even more than they did before. They're going to start to reject Chinese influence. And we're going to see the emergence of a group of people called samurai. And samurai were, uh, they were, let's, actually, let's just talk about samurai up here real quick. We have some room. 
Samurai were warriors who enforced the rules of the local leaders, of the local military leaders. That's what a samurai is. Uh, so normally, they had like, they were given jobs or tasks to do, but if they had done all their jobs or tasks, uh, they would often kind of go out so after their jobs. Um, they could go out and you know you know do normal stuff after work like they might go hunting. Uh, they might uh, they might go drinking, but they could also you know go out and like commit crimes. And because they are the ones who are enforcing the rules, there's not a whole lot that people can do about them. So the samurai were not always considered to be good guys. Um, and if we want to kind of put this into the context that maybe we're more familiar with, samurai are kind of like the equivalent of medieval knights. They kind of fulfill the same role in society that knights in medieval Europe might fill. Uh, we'll talk about them specifically in a few weeks, but you know, we usually think of knights as being good guys, but they really weren't always good guys. Um, there were good there were good knights and bad knights, just like there were good samurai and bad samurai. Um, but we'll stop there. Uh, so in our next set of videos, we're going to turn our attention away from East Asia and shift to Southwest Asia, where a new religion is going to emerge uh, in the same line as Judaism and Christianity. So this time we're going to talk about the emergence of Islam and how it radically changes what's going on in Southwest Asia and North Africa. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.